Byron, as Irene suggested, what I'll talk about really is just a very brief introduction to community planning and the context for that, but then really start to talk about, well, what's some of the evidence telling us that's helping to inform the work that community planning is doing, but therefore also relevant, I hope, to many of the other planners in the room today. So that's really what I'm hoping to touch upon today. Um, so we won't spend any time on the Community Empowerment Act because, as I did quite rightly said, this legislation will be covered throughout the day and that's not really where we want to start with today. But in terms of the Community Empowerment Act, one of the key things to highlight at this stage, and I hope it will be a theme that will really underpin all the discussions we have today, is that it's a whole range of different activity, all of which is underpinned by and the ethos of community empowerment and how do we engage meaningfully with local communities, in particular those communities that perhaps don't have the strongest voice. So community planning is a key element of that. Um, so in terms of um, the expectations around community planning, in a nutshell, they are about how public bodies work together um, um, with the local community to plan for, to resource and to provide services which, number one, improve outcomes, but perhaps most significantly also aim to reduce inequalities. And what I want to talk about this morning a little bit is what's the evidence showing us about inequalities in terms of where do we need to make more progress. Irene already highlighted at the beginning there about some of the areas across Scotland um, in terms of health and well-being where we want to increase the speed of progress. So th this is really why we wanted to share some of the evidence so that um, you can look at where do we need to focus our attention. These are the public bodies that are involved in community planning. So you've got the named bodies here who um, have the responsibilities around governance and leadership in the green box, but also the new legislation has expanded the duties across a whole wider range of organisations that are now involved in community planning. And as Irene says, I'm sorry for all the community planners in the room that uh, know this stuff much better than I do, but hopefully it's helpful for some of our other colleagues. So in terms of looking at well, what does the evidence tell us, first off we need to be clear about well, what are the duties that community planning now has to deliver. So first of all, there's now that common duty on all of those bodies that we just looked at, a common duty on them to work together. And the expectation is an ambitious one. It's not to work together to carry on doing what we're already doing. It's to work together to try and really challenge those complex and long-term issues particularly around inequalities, those issues that single organisations and single services simply cannot deliver the improvements that we're all aiming for. Um, there's also a duty to um, focus on improvement in outcomes and reducing inequalities and for this to be captured in local outcomes improvement plans and localities plans. Um, now these um, plans have to be reviewed and published with your local communities. Um, there's also a duty on all partners, again all partners that we've just looked at there, um, to make sure that what's in these plans is embedded in a key part of their own planning processes. And the key thing is they need to be allocating resources. And we go back to that's not meaning carry on doing what people were doing anyway, but it's about showing that people are shifting resources to actually do something differently collectively is what we're looking for there. And throughout all of this, <coughs> there needs to be a duty in all of these partners to do this with communities. Um, so that takes us back to, well, if this is what we're going to do in this real ambitious change to try and deliver the public sector reform we're going for, what do we need to know? Um, one of the key things we need to know is, yes, we need to know, well, what do outcomes look like for my area? But we need to know where and who are the most vulnerable communities in my area. If we're going to tackle inequalities, we need to be able to focus in on who those communities are, whether that's geographic communities and so therefore the focus on place, or whether or not it's communities of interest. But we need the data to help us focus in on vulnerability. 
So, I just want to share with you some of the information that we have from the Community Planning Outcomes Profile. So it's a resource that I know that many of the Community Planning Partnership colleagues have started to use already, but we think hopefully this will be useful for spatial planners also. What this profile does is it brings together the data that we have on outcomes. Imperfect though it is, it brings it all together in one place. And it shows how outcomes are changing over time. It shows them spatially. So for example, as you can see from that image there, you can see an area and you can focus in on vulnerability very quickly. So if you're trying to get public bodies to work together and focus on the same areas, this kind of tool can be a really helpful resource for having that conversation. Um, it also looks at outcomes in the round. Now that's critical if we're trying to focus on a more place-based approach because it's not just focusing on educational outcomes or crime outcomes or health outcomes, but it's actually saying for that particular community, um, how are their lives improving? And where are the significant inequalities across my area? Where are the areas that I need to focus in? So it looks at outcomes in the round and it really helps to focus on, um, on uh, vulnerability. We want to flag up that this tool we hope is particularly useful to help you identify and target those communities with whom you're going to be working closely with in order to help improve outcomes, but it can also be great information to start some of the conversations to have with local communities in terms of exploring what's driving some of these trends that we are seeing in this area. So hopefully the tool is something that can help the work that you're doing with communities as well as identifying those communities to work with. <coughs> so some of the data, what does it tell us? Um, the first thing I was mentioning is it shows the overall pattern of outcomes within your local authority or CPP area. This is an example from Argyll and Butte. Um, and what you can see immediately there is a group of core outcomes that cover health and well-being from birth to old age, that also cover the local economy outcomes, and also uh, cover more community outcomes such as community fragility and crime and elements like that. So it's a core group of outcomes and we show the trend over time for your area and compare it to Scotland or any other area that you might be interested in comparing. So for Argyll and Butte, um, I shall just highlight a couple here that might be of interest. So for example, this one here is emergency admissions. So we're looking at the rate of emergency admissions. And what we can see there with our Gallup is even though at Scotland level, it's an area where we're seeing increasing levels of emergency admissions for the over 65s, which is a real concern against our policy agenda of trying to support older people to live safely in their homes. We can see our Gallup Butte as the green line and actually they are bucking the national trend. So that's of interest to all of us. What might they be doing in that area that drives that? Likewise with early mortality, which is um, just this one here. Similarly, in our Gallup Butte, they have consistently our lower rates of early mortality than Scotland. So again, these are some positive trends in perhaps offering <coughs> themes for us to learn about. But the one after early mortality at the end is fragility. And that's one to highlight because that's clearly an area for our Gallup Butte as a priority. And I know it is something that they look at. Um, fragility is about basically your aging population, your working population, the overall dense um, uh, ratio that you have with that and also it's a capture of are people leaving remote rural communities and moving into the, the more urban conurbations and so that trend there for Argyll and Butte shows that it's a much bigger risk factor for Argyll and Butte than many other areas in Scotland so that might be a priority area. If we then try and focus in a bit more on inequalities and what the data is showing us around inequalities, I've just picked on health and well-being here because again, we know this is an area relevant for every day in the room, both community planning and spatial planning. 
the first thing these graphs, you can't see it very clearly, but the, the solid line in the middle is the Scotland, and then the dotted lines show the most deprived and the least deprived communities. So the first thing to highlight there is the level of inequality that still exists between the most deprived communities and the least deprived communities across health and wellbeing. Now we're picking up there uh, childhood obesity, we've got emergency admissions, we've got healthy life expectancy, and children's mental health. The children's mental health is a difference between um, adolescent boys and girls there you can see that gap is growing um, what we can see there is that with the ones that are red that shows that the inequality is widening so what we're currently doing is not making the difference in terms of actually narrowing that inequality at a Scotland level so these issues are still very real and we need to be looking at different ways of organising and delivering our services if we're going to turn these around. And we know that spatial planning is such an important role to play here, whether it's access to the good quality open space, active travel, so for example where are we building our schools, are we still enabling, encouraging children to walk to school, housing and communities are they being built and designed for our ageing population. So all of these are critical for health and wellbeing outcomes. Fragile communities, again, same structure here. In these graphs, you've got the top and bottom lines reflect the inequality that exists in our society. Um, the ones that are red are showing increasing levels of inequality. So, for example, if we talk about community empowerment, if you look at the perceived ability to influence local decisions, not only is there significant inequality, but the inequality between the most and the least deprived communities is widening there. And if we're talking about using community planning and spatial planning and building them around meaningful engagement with communities, that's a really significant factor for us to look at how we address. Um, so these are some of the national trends that we wanted to highlight, but ultimately what this tool allows you to do, apologies, you won't be able to read the detail here, that's partly on purpose, but this resource is available online, and we'll make sure that we share the link with everybody, so you can hopefully go in and have a look about afterwards, but I just want to talk through a couple of the things that the tool will allow you to do. The first thing it allows you to do is um, it allows you to look at um, all of the communities in your particular CPP area and to see which are the most vulnerable and also allows you to see which ones are improving or not improving. So the first column here takes um, the, the list of those communities and it puts them in order. So the most vulnerable is at the top and then the least down at the bottom. So that's really important. Again, if you're trying to have the conversation across services and across the partnership, it helps you focus on those communities where we want to see improvement. Um, this is the online tool. So this is a, the example of Dundee. And that first column you see is every small area community across Dundee. And what we're doing is we're starting with Hilltown and City Centre um, up at the top and then right down to the West End, the Western Edge, down at the bottom in terms of vulnerability. Um, if you then want to focus in on a community that has been identified as being particularly vulnerable, this then allows you to get into more detail. So here again, we have one for North Ayrshire, so um, I'm sure we're going to hear a bit more about North Ayrshire today as well, but um, what this shows you is if you were to pick the most vulnerable community to actually better understand what's going on, the graphs over on the right hand side allow you to actually see the trends in particular outcome areas. So for the particular community we've chosen in North Ayrshire, what you can see, thank you, what you can see is that one of the areas that they're struggling with for that particular community is the rate of emergency admissions, which is increasing at this point. It's the second one up here. And you can see the red line reflects that particular community. And you can see that it's increasing um, at a much faster rate than even the whole CPP area. So again, you'd be interested to explore what's going on in that particular area to drive that, and that would be something that would be used to both community planning and spatial planning. Um, similarly, early mortality, it's coming down, but it's higher than the CPP area, so it's something that um, you might want to focus in on and collaborate around. What these two columns show you is it allows you to then look at, well, we've got this community in our CPP area, 
But what's happening to similar communities across Scotland? If we think about communities that are similar in terms of um, geography, similar in terms of demography, and similar in terms of level of deprivation, are any of them doing better than this particular community? Is there anything we can learn from the approaches that organisations, <coughs> public bodies, or communities are doing differently in those areas? So this column, the community that we've actually picked there, within its group has the poorest outcomes. So you might want to focus on some of these communities at the bottom because they may be doing something different that's helping to deliver better outcomes and it gives you that opportunity to share practice across Scotland. <coughs> and just the final thing I wanted to share about this resource is if you were also collectively looking at a particular outcome area, so for example, this one is emergency admissions, we're back to Dundee for this one, what the tool allows you to do is to say, well, let's quickly have a look at every community in Dundee and let's see which communities are um, improving and which communities have poor outcomes in this area. And again, it gives you that evidence. We were talking at the beginning about the why. Why do we need to work together? Why are we needing to collaborate and do something different with our resources? Well, you can see there when you look at the data that there's a number of communities in Dundee that have significantly higher rates of emergency admissions and they are increasing at a much faster rate. So if we are trying to reduce inequalities, that really helps you to focus your attention. It helps to bring the organisations together around about these common goals and that's hopefully what some of the elements can help. Um, so in terms of the, the key thing to pull out for me for the data is really that it's a way of highlighting inequalities and vulnerabilities with a focus on place. We know that there are other groups that we need to focus on also, but what this data really helps you to do is to focus in on communities and place. It is one source, so we recognise it's limited and you need to use a whole range of other pieces of information, but we hope this will be a helpful part of the discussion. What we hope it can do, so for community planning and spatial planners, is as you all work together, it can help you focus in on where can, by working together, we deliver the greatest benefit, but it can also help you see, are we making a difference? And that's part of the key hopefully benefit of a tool like this is over time you can use it to show your communities you're working with and the other organisations we are making a difference or alternatively if we're not making the kind of difference we need to and so that's hopefully what this resource will help with. So I hope I haven't gone over too much but it's a, an introduction so thank you. Thank you very much.